Good morning. Thank you for being here. April 26th, 1986. You probably don't remember where you were. I was 11. But there's some big stuff happening in Europe. Geiger counters all over Europe were going crazy. Nothing was going on in Europe, though. And so they started looking at the neighbor, Soviet, the Soviet Union. And the Soviets said, there's nothing going on here. And they said, um, we can see the smoke. There's something happening. <laughs> well, they said, well, it, yeah, there might be a fire, but it's outside of our Chernobyl nuclear facility. It's not anything to do with that. Well, there's no way for us to verify that story. Uh, we, the Soviet Union was basically remote politically. We couldn't go and verify the story, especially their nuclear programs. And so, lucky for the world, Landsat 5 flew overhead three days later. So this image is from April 29th, 1986. And we were able to document, you can maybe see a tiny little pinkish red dot way at the top there above the little white line. And that was all we needed to determine that there was actually a fire at Chernobyl in React, but it was inside reactor number four. Landsat 5 has a thermal instrument on board, which means that it can actually see in the spectrum of thermal that you and I can't see in. But we learned later that that meltdown fire was probably in excess of 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why we were able to determine it was in fact a nuclear meltdown. I've studied the Earth from space for over 20 years, and it's changed the way that I look at really complicated problems. In fact, I've had to sort of realize that there might never be a right answer to some things. And so I'm going to challenge you today to consider that everything you know may not be true, and that your life experience has most certainly set you up to only see a part of any story. I'm going to take you on a journey today around the world from the 705 orbit, which is about 438 miles above the Earth's surface. And I'm going to share with you just a few stories about this tension that we see all the time between Earthlings and the planet we inhabit. We're going to start in Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a really impressive array of preserves, national parks, biological stations, and the one that I know best is in the southeastern part of the country called Las Cruces Biological Reserve. And in this image, you can see the outline of the park, right? You can see that southern border and the western border really distinctively. And so this is illustrative of this tension between humans and the planet, right? In the sense of the whole idea behind protecting places is if we don't protect it, people will destroy it, right? And so what you see around Las Cruces Biological Station today is ranch land. So it's people trying to make a living, um, very similar to what we have around here, except there's a lot more rain there. Um, Las Cruces is a place that's very biologically diverse. I saw hummingbirds with a nest with eggs that were about the half the size of a pencil eraser. And uh, I was on a walk at dusk by accident, really, that's a different story. Um, and I jumped, I had to jump over uh, the fair de lance, which is a deadly snake. Um, Monteverde cloud forest in the northern, more northern part of the country has over 400 species of orchids alone, and probably a lot of bugs, but whatever. So I'm sure they're very important. But the idea about protecting land so that we don't destroy them is really a complicated issue because it's a very simplistic view. Because under the canopy of this forest lies the secret that it's no virgin. 400 years ago, this forest had maize growing. Well, the forest is today. And we know this by looking at lake sediments that preserve in this case, up to 3,000 years of pollen that we can then reconstruct and check out what was going on in the landscape thousands of years ago. And so maize is present on this landscape for almost 3,000 years, as well as a pretty high density of charcoal, which means humans were involved, because the, the rainforest doesn't burn by itself. And so how do we determine what to save in our landscapes truly apart from humans? How do we balance these save the earth versus put humans first? There's, the, the magic is usually somewhere in between. And we're going to go to the Colorado River. The Colorado River headwaters are in the Rockies, 
Um, I've actually jumped across it just to say that I did, right? Because this river is huge. It runs 1,450 miles across the American Southwest all the way to the Sea of Cortez, Gulf of California. If you've been to the Grand Canyon, Moab, Utah, um, the Hoover Dam, you've been to the Colorado River. It waters agricultural areas, Tucson, Phoenix, Vegas, the Imperial Valley of California. Unfettered, it delivers 16 million acre feet to the ocean. But today, from this image you can see, um, this is the delta today. 200 years ago, this delta was filled with millions of birds and lush vegetation. So you can see immediately that there's no vegetation here. Even more tragically, perhaps, today, the Colorado River doesn't actually even reach the ocean most years. And you can see in this image where, I'm going to try to point this out to you, where it ends about right here. And this is the tidal flats then of the ocean. So it doesn't even get there anymore. How did this happen? Well, I mentioned the dams and the diversions and the agriculture. Well, what happened is in 1922, all the states got together and decided, okay, we're going to divide the river up. And they didn't do it arbitrarily. They looked at 30 years of data. And they said, this is a reasonable amount of water to take out of the system and still leave 10% to flow through Mexico into the ocean. Well, what happened was that 30 years of data was the wettest or one of the wettest 30 years in a thousand years. So when the researchers started looking at tree rings and reconstructing wet years and dry years, there's a couple peaks of wetness in the last thousand years of dryness, and one of them just happened to be right before 1922. So what do we do? How do we change this? We have people depending on water. Do we let the planet suffer to keep the humans happy? To keep the humans, and not only happy, fed, clothed. I mean, we're not talking like people are just dumping this water, you know, um, out in the desert for no good reason, right? They're using this water for be to better their lives. Well, the good news is, is that we can learn from our past, and today the water does actually reach the ocean. And the reason this happened is because everyone got together, U.S. and Mexico mostly, and said, you know what? We can't prioritize humans alone, and so we have to reestablish some water to Mexico. That was the real key to Mexico, a basal flow, and periodic pulses to wash out sandbars, and you may have heard about some of that going on. But surprisingly, the river reached the ocean again. They didn't really expect that to happen. And so this is, the good, this is a good news story, although you can see that the delta is still far from the millions of birds and the lush vegetation. Sort of on that topic of dryness, it seems like our, the western U.S. can burn some years from the end to end. And why does this happen? So I'm going to take you to Wallace, Idaho. Wallace, Idaho is a small town in the beautiful uh, forest in, in northern Idaho, and it was in the literal middle of a literal firestorm in 1910. It was actually called the Great Fire of 1910, and it was the talk of the country at the time. I mean, we see a lot of fires today, and you don't even hear about them. It might roll through your Facebook feed, and you're like, oh, look, there's a fire somewhere. But you don't, it's not really a, some, a topic of conversation. Well, this was a massive fire, and, but the re, one of the reasons it was such a big deal to everyone is because it was overlaid on a really interesting political firestorm. So the man on the left is Pincho. He believed that force should be used for humans to the best we could do it. So timber, wood products, ATV riding, cutting down your Christmas tree, whatever that means. John Muir, on the other hand, believes that forests where a cathedral should be kept apart from the saw. Well, these two men, their vision we see today in the, the U.S. Forest Service for Pinchot, Park Service for Muir. Interesting thing, these men were bitter enemies because they were contemporaries, they were fighting for completely different use of the land of the West. Teddy Roosevelt was president at the time. Interesting thing, though, the one thing that united them was their hatred of fire. Because if you believe the forest is a cathedral or you believe it's a resource for use, the worst thing that can happen is for it to burn to the ground. And so by 1935, the rule in the United States was that you should put out a fire by 10 a.m. the next morning after a fire is spotted. The tricky thing about putting out fires, though, is that fires are essential to Western forests to keep them healthy. Burns the 
old needles out, at, um, dead and dying trees. In fact, the adaptation to fire is so, so advanced in some, in some cases that you need fire to open the cones so that the seeds can drop and new baby trees can grow. So it should have fire about every five years or so. Low burning fire, it lets the big trees stay big and happy, it just keeps that understory open. Deer love it, animals love it. Well, what happens when we suppress these fires for decades and decades? Really big fires happen. So when I was in Yosemite, this is Yellowstone, when I was in Yosemite about 10 years ago with some friends who were doing some research there, we were out walking through the woods, and there was dead wood that was higher than my head. So you can imagine a lightning strike that happens in that kind of forest. So what happens is, on the left here, you see Yellowstone in 1987, and on the right, you see Yellowstone in 1988. And, and Yellowstone is 3,500 square miles. It's huge. And this image is actually a little bigger than the park boundaries. And so Yellowstone alone lost over 30% of its forest to this one big fire season. The fires didn't go out until snow fell. They could, it was so big they couldn't put them out. So this really started us pushing back on that idea that we need to suppress fire. Because again, we need to see the earth as, the, as its whole system, not just what we choose to see in it. Today, we try to let those fires burn and protect people and their things, and it's this really wonky balance that sometimes is very successful, other times it's not. We just hope these folks stay safe while doing it. So the next place we're going to go to is probably one of the largest environmental disasters in the world, and you've probably have never heard of it. Um, this is the Aral Sea, or was the Aral Sea, and you can maybe see the old lake bed here. It actually runs off the bottom of the screen, and this is several hundred miles across. The Aral Sea used to be the fifth largest inland water body in the world, and this is what it looks like today. In the 1960s, the Soviets started to divert water, the inflowing rivers, for agriculture, for everything from melons to cotton. And it's really because the arid steppe is a very hard place to have a lot of success financially. Like, it's really kind of hard scrabble living. So I thought, well, here's this water resource. Let's use it to raise up our standard of living. So, in fact, cotton was called white gold at the time. And so they started growing cotton in the middle of Uzbekistan, what is today Uzbekistan. So here you can see 1977 on the left. This was about 10 years after they started drawing down the water. Now, the thing to remember about the arid steppe of Asia is that there's more evaporation out of the lake than there is rainfall. So the only way to keep that lake actually a lake is to let the rivers flow into it. And so Uzbekistan has continued to keep that irrigation going. Can you imagine if we told farmers today, sorry, you can't have the water you've been using for the last 50 years? there would be a revolt, right? as probably there should be. So again, we have this challenge between earthlings and the planet, and how we're going to work together. One of the good news stories about this is that the North Aral Sea um, has been recognized as perhaps savable. So in the last few years, they've actually put a dam on the south side of the lake, and that lake is actually refilling up, and the fisheries are starting to come back to a harvestable size. So that's an exciting lesson that we've all learned. And we've talked about eating food off the land, but what if you depend on the ocean for most of your protein? Well, we've all heard about the oceans being overfished. So what is there to do? Harder to show on a satellite data, on a satellite image. But this is Singapore, 18,000 people per square mile. In South Dakota, there are counties with less than one person per square mile. So it's quite a bit different. So what people are trying to do for food from the ocean is farm it. And so this is a picture from Greece, actually. And so what they do is they, inside each one of those circles, they farm fish. And this seems like one of those maybe don't prioritize humans or don't prioritize the earth, but somehow find a middle ground, that magic place in between. There are still, the jury's still a bit out on this because as you can imagine, when you put food in there and all the fish don't eat the food, the food goes out into the ocean, causing some over nutrient, um, super nutrient problems. Um, also, they're afraid that fish might escape and start um, 
co-mingling with the um, wild fish and messing up the DNA. And so this is, might be one of those um, compromises that we can come to when we bring the two outsides closer to the middle. When I was in college, I used to be able to talk both sides of any argument. And it used to drive everyone crazy. But it also used to make me feel like that was a weakness. Like I had a lack of conviction to one side or the other. But today I really try to channel that feeling because I think that the answers to really complicated problems, like the ones we looked at today, are never on the ends. They're always in the magic place in the middle. So I challenge you to try to do that for yourself, to turn to a neighbor today, find something intentionally that you disagree about, and actually have a conversation about why. Ask them why, you tell your story. Find that magic in-between place where you actually find out, you know what, we actually agree like 80% on this. We might disagree on a few other details. It's vitally important. As Landsat pushes into the development of its ninth spacecraft, we're gonna start talking a lot more about the cryosphere or the frozen water on our Earth, on our ever-warming Earth. So wouldn't it be great if by the time we actually get to those really hard conversations, that we could actually talk to each other and, and pick solutions, not from the ends, but from in the middle somewhere, and that we find solutions that, that satisfy my needs and your needs and your needs, and maybe even your needs by the time we get there. I think it's vital to the progression and success of dealing with these ever more complicated challenges as we move forward. Thank you.